A rash of booklets have appeared in recent days espousing the post-tribulation viewpoint. One would think that the writers had just discovered undisclosed secrets hidden from the foundation of the world. However, none of their arguments are new. Neither should one be impressed with their listing of scholars who propagate the theory. For every prophetical genius proposing the post-tribulation view, there are 50 scholars who proclaim the great escape, all the pre-tribulation rapture. However, names are meaningless on either side because Scripture is the final authority on any given subject, including the meeting in the air. So what saith the Holy Spirit? First, let's define the tribulation. It is a definite period of unparalleled trouble and sorrow upon the earth. Daniel 12, 1 states, There shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 21, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Revelation 3.10 speaks of it as the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. This unprecedented period of tribulation is not to be confused with daily tribulations all God's people experience. Jesus said, in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world, John 16, 33. Paul exhorted the brethren at Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch to continue in the faith, and that through many tribulations they and we must enter the kingdom of God. Acts 14, verses 21 and 22. To the Roman Christians he wrote, we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, Romans 5, 3. Now these heartaches, problems, and perplexities experienced by all of God's people at various times are not to be confused with the Great Tribulation, Revelation 7, 14. This designated seven-year period is one of immense suffering for the entire world. It is an era of unthinkable tribulation. Alas, for that day is great, so that there is none like it, Jeremiah 30, verse 7. There is nothing in past history to describe this period of time, nor will there ever be anything to equal it in future years. Revelation chapters 6, 8, 9, 15, and 16 graphically describe the Holocaust. The seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven vials unfold the tragic and soon coming scene. Study this listing of chapters and judgments. This seven-year period constitutes the bleakest, darkest hour of history. One half of civilization is obliterated. This would total two billion human beings if the event occurred presently. Then the final catastrophic stroke after fulfilling the 21 judgments is the Battle of Armageddon, verse 16. It is closely associated time-wise with the final or seventh vial and becomes the Battle of the Ages. During the tribulation period, Russia marches to the Middle East. Gog, Magog, Meshach, Rosh, and her allies are obliterated. God says, Behold, I'm against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn thee back and leave but the sixth part of thee. Ezekiel 39, verses 1 and 2. Millions will die in this Mideast war, and seven months shall the house of Israel be bearing of them, that they may cleanse the land. Ezekiel 39, 12. For further insight into this subject, right from my album entitled The Coming War with Russia, According to the Bible. This invasion of the Middle East is not Armageddon, but leads to Armageddon, the climactic moment in world history when Christ returns with the armies of heaven to end war forever, as pictured in Revelation 19, verses 11 to 21. John states, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war, Armageddon. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him, the king of kings, and against his army. The result, verse 21, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him, Christ, that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. 
This concludes Earth's glorious hour. This is the end of the tribulation period. Christ immediately sets up his millennial kingdom. And then humanity beats its swords into plowshares and its spears into pruning hooks, Isaiah 2, 4. Then universal peace begins. Then utopia commences. Would to God the millennium were here. It will come, but not until after Earth's horrendous bloodbath has occurred, the tribulation hour. Will the church escape this time of immense and intense suffering? My answer is an emphatic yes. I am a pre-tribulationist proclaiming dogmatically the evacuation of the church before 21 judgments begin. I base my conclusions upon the following scriptural premises. First, Jacob's time of trouble. Jeremiah 30, verse 7 states, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. This prophet in chapters 30 and 31 summarizes Israel's endurance in the awe of tribulation depicts it as Jacob's or Israel's trouble. All the Old Testament prophets harmoniously affirm this truth. In Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39, the northern enemy or Russian bear comes out of the north against Israel. Seventeen different passages mark Israel as the victim. Ezekiel says, Thou shalt come up against my people of Israel, chapter 38, verse 16. Daniel describes this horrible period of tribulation in chapter 12, verse 1 says there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, thy people, Israelites, shall be delivered. Daniel's 70 weeks, of which the tribulation period is the closing segment, has to do with Israel. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the Most Holy, Daniel 9.24. The 69 weeks totaling 483 years already passed had to do with Israel. Why would God change his mode of operation for the 70th week, the tribulation hour? The simple conclusion is that there is no change. God returns to his original program for the final week. This is again the reason that Satan, upon being cast to earth during the tribulation hour, goes after the woman, Israel, who brought forth the man-child, Christ, in Revelation 12, verses 12 to 17. Only anti-literalists and anti-dispensationalists confuse the issue. They allegorize, spiritualize, and pulverize the truth into mass confusion. They make Jews of all the redeemed or relegate the title of Israelites to Americans, Canadians, and other Anglo-Saxonites. Little do they realize that there can be no harmony of the Scriptures when one does not rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. Now, what is the truth? It is that God has two elect groups of individuals on this earth, Israel and the church. Israel is the wife of Jehovah forever, and the church is the bride of Christ. Romans chapters 9 to 11 depict Israel's past, chapter 9, Israel's present, chapter 10, and Israel's future, chapter 11. During the tribulation hour, all Israel shall be saved, Romans 11, 26. The 144,000 Jewish evangelists, Revelation 7, verses 4 to 8, will proclaim the gospel of the kingdom to all the world, Matthew 24, 14. And all Israel will accept Messiah, or Christ, as Savior and King. Now these Israelites are the elect or the election beloved for the Father's sake, Romans 11, 28. This solves the problem of Matthew 24, 22, which states, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Post-tribulationists vehemently cry, You see, the elect are present for the judgments of Matthew 24, proving that the church goes through the terrible hour. The elect are certainly present, but they are the elect of Romans 11, 28, Israelites. That is why they pray that their flight for safety is not on the Sabbath day, Matthew 24, 20. And why they are fleeing from Judea to the mountains, verse 16. And why they are preaching the good news of the coming king, verse 14. And why they are brought into synagogues, Luke 21, 12, located near Jerusalem, verse 14. 24. 
Yes, the elect are present for the tribulation hour, but they are not members of the bride of Christ. They are Israelites, the father's elect wife. Jehovah chose or elected Israel to be his wife, and Christ chose or elected his people to be his bride. Concerning Israel, Deuteronomy 7, 6 states, Thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. This promise is perpetual, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance or change of mind. Romans eleven twenty nine. This is the reason that all Israel is going to be saved. Verse 26. God keeps his covenants, verse 27, and Israelites are still the Father's election, verse 28 of Romans 11. To the Christian, Christ says in John 15, 16, you have not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you, you see? Now, there's no difficulty whatsoever when men see both elections, but confusion reigns when the two are intermingled, spiritualized, allegorized, and symbolized. Take God for what he says, literally, and the problems vanish. The trouble began when Christ came to earth the first time nearly 2,000 years ago. The Old Testament prophets predicted that a powerful potentate, a majestic king, would come to rule over Israel. That's why the wise men in searching for the child asked in Matthew 2, 2, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? What the people failed to see as they studied the prophets was that this Christ would suffer humiliation and pain before becoming a powerful ruler, Isaiah 53. Because of it, they rejected Christ. John 1.11 states, He came unto his own Israel, and his own received him not. This is why Christ commanded his disciples, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 10, verses 5 and 6. He would offer himself as king to Israel first. In fact, his advance man, John the Baptist, cried, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Or, the king is coming. Matthew 3, 7. However, the king was rejected, just as Daniel predicted. He said, Daniel 9.25, After three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Now these are weeks or sevens of years. God's timetable amounts to 70 weeks, 70 times 7, or 490 years in his dealings with Israel. The first seven weeks or 49 years had to do with the rebuilding of Jerusalem in troublesome times. Daniel 9.25, the second division of 62 weeks, or 434 years, signaled the time of Christ's death after the rebuilding of Jerusalem. The prophecy happened exactly on schedule. Christ came and offered himself to Israel, but was rejected and cut off after the time Daniel prophesied. Chapter 9, verse 26. This was the crucifixion after the completion of his offer as king. Now Israel must pay the price for rejecting her king. So a final week is coming when the Antichrist shall confirm the covenant with many for one week or seven years. Now in the name of common sense, why should this final week of seven years be revamped to chastise the church when the other 69 weeks dealt with Israel? Simple logic plus a superabundance of scripture makes it clear that this is the time of Jacob's or Israel's trouble for rejecting Israel. Our king. The chastisement creates an attitude of acceptance for the coming king at the close of the 70th week. There's no doubt about it. Israel travails greatly before the king returns. Daniel describes this day of sorrow when a monstrous anti-Semite dictator satanically energized speaks words against the Most High and wears out the saints of the Most High. Daniel 7 verse 25 Jesus also said in Matthew 24, verses 9, 21, and 22, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. And you, Israelites, shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Then shall be great tribulations, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, known or ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, Israel, Romans eleven twenty eight, their sake, those days shall be shortened. However, the same prophets envision the physical and spiritual salvation of the nation of Israel. 
Jeremiah 30, verse 7 states, Israel shall be saved out of it. Daniel cries in chapter 12, verse 1, At that time thy people, Jews, shall be delivered. Jesus also declared the shortening of the days for the preservation of the elect Israelites. And also said, As the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Matthew 24, 37. Noah was preserved through the judgment on the ark. This pictures Israel's preservation through the time of judgment. Notice also that Israel's physical and spiritual salvation has to do with the return of her king. This king of kings and lord of lords shall ride to earth when the daughter of Zion, a weeping wanderer in Babylon, shall be in pain and labor, yea, in travail. Micah 4.10 when is our Lord coming back to earth? It will be in that day when Jerusalem shall be taken and the houses rifled by international anti-Semitic bandits. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. Zechariah 14, verses 2 to 4. Surely, no reasonable, rational thinker will disagree with the facts presented to this point. Surely no one will try to place the bride of Christ into the text or context used in this message. It is abundantly clear that God is dealing with Israel during the hour of tribulation, not the church. Christ's elect bride has been evacuated. The great escape has occurred. The believers within the dispensation of grace forming the church are gone. They vanished at the trumpet blast of 1 Thessalonians 4.16, which declares, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. From that point onward, the church is where Christ is, the bride with the bridegroom. This is explicitly clear from the statement, so shall we ever be with the Lord. When the 70th week is finished for Israel, Christ returns to earth. Since the church is forever where the Lord is, they return with the king to earth. Revelation 19, 14 states, the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Jude verse 14 reports the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Post-tribulationists tell us that the church at the end of the tribulation goes up to meet Christ and immediately returns with the king. I cannot accept the yo-yo theory, up and down, presto whipto. This leaves no time for the judgment seat of Christ or the marriage supper of the Lamb. Instead, Christ raptures his church into glory. The judgment seat occurs in the heavenlies as the tribulation bombards the earth. Both elect groups are being prepared for the millennium. Then at the conclusion of the 70th week, Christ returns with the army believers who were part of the original great escape and immediately judges the nations on the basis of their treatment of his brethren, Israelites. Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. Presently, every anti-Semitic voice heard is indicative that the king is about to return but before he comes to establish his kingdom the great escape via the rapture takes place for christ's bride immediately after this evacuation the judgment of believers begins in preparation for the marriage supper of the lamb and i again repeat the post-tribulational yo-yo theory where believers bob up and down, rising and returning in the twinkling of an eye, leaves no room for either the judgment seat of Christ or the marriage supper of the Lamb. Both of these events are time-consuming and cannot fit into a scheme of interpretation where believers go up to meet the Lord and instantly return with Him for the establishment of His millennial kingdom. Time is demanded for the investigation of the believer's works. 2 Corinthians 5.10 declares, We believers must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one of us may receive the things done in his body. Romans 14.12 adds, Every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. This examination of every believer demands time. The post-tribulational air leaves no vacancies for the greatest events in the history of the church. Should one argue that this judgment is the one described in Matthew 25 or Revelation 20, he has immediately lost the debate. Revelation 20 is the great white throne judgment at the end of time for sinners. Matthew 25 is the judgment of Gentile nations. 
This is not the investigation of the bride by the bridegroom, but the judgment of the king as he prepares the nations of earth for his kingdom upon earth. Verse 34 states, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. This coincides with the return of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords in Revelation 19:16. This is the hour he establishes his 1,000-year reign upon the earth, Revelation 20, verse 6. The judgment seat of Christ, contrarywise, is the investigation of Christ's virgin, 2 Corinthians 11, 2, preparing her for the marriage feast and honeymoon. There is no doubt as to the time this examination occurs. 1 John 2, 28 states, Little children, abide in Christ, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. The verse begins with Christ's appearing and ends with his coming. And it is at this time that his people are either confident or ashamed in his presence. This investigation of the bride's works takes approximately seven years. While Israel is being judged on earth, the bride is being examined in heaven. This testing of the bride is necessary because Christ wants his sweetheart presented to him not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Ephesians 5, 27. This presentation of the spotless bride takes place at the marriage supper of the Lamb, Christ, the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sins of the world, John 1, 29, has his purified bride by his side as the myriad of voices at the greatest marriage feast in history unanimously cry, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen and clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he said unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19, verses 7 and 9. Only a modern-day post-tribulational Houdini could place the church or bride on earth in this chapter. Notice verse 1, the great voice of many people was heard in heaven. In this same heaven, heaven, the judgment of all believers took place, for his wife made herself ready, verse 7. Her fine linen, clean and white, picturing the righteousness of saints, verse 8, proves that the judgment seat already took place in heaven, and now she is ready to sit next to her bridegroom for the marriage supper, verse 9. Watch the next movement. The supper being ended, the bride returns to earth from heaven with her bridegroom, for earth's 1,000-year honeymoon. Verse 11 pictures Christ on a white horse returning and his people, the armies in heaven, following him. Verse 14, the purpose of the triumphant return is to purge the earth of its sinful rebels through the battle of Armageddon, verses 17 to 21, making the millennial honeymoon one of peace and joy. This is true because Satan is bound for a thousand years. Then the saints take their thrones and the bride rules and reigns with her lover. Revelation 20, verses 1 to 6. Now in the name of common sense, how can all this happen in the post-tribulationist scheme of interpretation? The marriage feast would still be sticking in the crawl and severe indigestion would ensue if it all occurred in a moment of time. Certainly, the Word of God is on the side of pre-tribulationists. The question is, are you ready for Christ's return? Have you trusted in Christ's shed blood for the remission of your sins? Don't delay. The church may slip away in the twinkling of an eye at any moment. An indescribable holocaust unparalleled in history is about to bombard planet Earth. It is described as the Great Tribulation, Revelation 7.14, the Hour of Temptation, Revelation 3.10, a day of great wrath, Revelation 6.17, and an hour when the wrath of God Almighty is unleashed in all the world, Revelation 19.15. This calamitous time of judgment lasts approximately seven years since the 69 weeks of Daniel total 483 years each week representing seven years, it is only logically deducible to make the final 70th week a period of seven years also. This harmonizes with the calculations of the second half of the tribulation hour described as a period of 42 months, Revelation 11:2, or 1,260 days, Revelation 11:3. 3 
When one considers God's purpose for the tribulation, it is difficult to place the bride of Christ into such a horrendous scene. Why should Christ's virgin bride suffer the judgments of the seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven vials? Why place her in the midst of the judgments recorded in Revelation chapter 6, 8, 9, 11, 15, and 16? when the church cannot be found beyond the third chapter of the book. The purpose of Christ during the worst hour in history is not to abuse his bride, but to execute wrath upon an ungodly world. God does this in a twofold manner. First, he purges out any Jewish rebels before establishing his millennial kingdom. God states, I will cause you to pass under the rod, the great tribulation, and I will purge out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me, and they shall not into the land, Ezekiel 20, verses 37 and 38. Secondly, he punishes Gentile rejectors. God continues, I will execute vengeance in anger and fury upon the Gentiles, such as they have not heard, Micah 5, 15. So the tribulation hour is primarily a time of judgment upon a Christ and God-rejecting world, both Jewish and Gentile. This judgment is so horrifying that Titus 2.13 becomes an absurdity if one must first look for seven years of heartache. The text states, looking for that blessed or happy hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. The reason this hope is a blessed or happy one is that the church escapes the turmoil of earth's goriest hour. This fact is confirmed by the teaching of Jesus. He said that the days of the Son of Man would be like the days of Noah and Lot, Luke 17, verses 26 to 32. In Noah's day, Enoch, a type of the church, was evacuated before the judgment of the flood, while Noah, a type of Israel, was preserved through it. Lot, in his removal to Zoar, before the fires fell, is also a type of the escaping church before atomic incineration begins. After God removed Lot and his loved ones, he said in Genesis 19, 22, I could do nothing until Lot become thither, or until Lot was removed. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the day of the Son of Man, or at the return of the Lord. God did not fail to spare his prepared people in past history, and will not fail his redeemed in the future. God's word makes it implicitly clear that the church will be spared the wrath of God. This day of great wrath, Revelation 6, 17. This wrath is meted out to sinners who store up, treasure up, yea, accumulate wrath against the day of wrath, Romans 2, 5. But this wrath is only for the wicked. Paul wrote, God hath delivered us Christians from the wrath to come, 1 Thessalonians 1.10. And again, God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Thessalonians 5.9. This salvation from wrath cannot be the eternal deliverance from hell because the Christian already has that without Christ's return. The moment one believes, he is delivered from condemnation unto life, John 5.24. Because of it, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 1. The deliverance from wrath in 1 Thessalonians 1, 10 has to do with Christ's return because the text states, we wait for his Son from heaven who delivers us from the wrath to come. It does not take the return of Christ to deliver us from the wrath of hell. Salvation instantaneously accomplishes this. But the coming of Christ delivers us from the wrath of the coming tribulation hour. This is how God keeps us from, Greek, ek, out of, the hour of temptation which comes upon all the world, Revelation 3.10. The book of Revelation is also written chronologically and beautifully sets forth the believer's deliverance from wrath. Revelation 1.18 states, Write the things which thou hast seen, chapter 1. Write the things which are, chapters 2 and 3. Write the things which shall be, chapters 4 to 22. Presently, the 20th century finds us in Revelation chapter 3. The churches of Philadelphia and Laodicea are both present in modern Christendom. The church of Philadelphia is snatched away before the seal judgments begin in Revelation 6. God tells this group, I will keep you from the hour of temptation that comes upon all the world to try them that dwell on the earth. Chapter 3, verse 10. John sees the great escape or evacuation of believers in chapter 4, verse 1. He says, after this, after what? 
after the seven church program described in chapters two and three has run its course chronologically, then I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard talking with me said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. I believe this to be the rapture because 24 elders picturing the saints of all ages, all and New Testament believers are already crowned and casting the rewards at Christ's feet in verses 10 and 11. The judgment seat has already taken place and the rewards distributed as the chapter ends. Now the crowning of the saints in chapter 4 plus the fact that the church is conspicuously absent, not even mentioned after chapter 4, certainly becomes meaningful if English and chronology means anything. Then two chapters later, Revelation 6, the tribulation judgments pictured by the seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven vials begin and continue until the King of Kings and Lord of Lords returns for the battle of Armageddon and the establishment of the kingdom, Revelation chapters 19 and 20. All this is so compellingly clear that even if post-tribulationists converted to Judaism, they could not miss the rapture. They could not become elect Israel, even if they tried. Now, let's consider another great pre-trib truth, the 24 elders. After the come up hither of Revelation 4.1, 24 elders are casting crowns at Christ's feet, verses 10 and 11. Then the throne is set up in chapter 5. Around God's throne are 24 thrones on which sat 24 elders, clothed in white garments, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now, who are the 24 elders? And this is of extreme importance for pre-trib proponents. So listen carefully. They are the representatives of God's people in both testaments, the saints of all ages. The book of Revelation unites the representative groups often. For instance, in describing the holy city in Revelation 21, verses 12 to 14, the names of the 12 tribes of Israel, Old Testament, are posted on the gates, while the names of the twelve apostles, New Testament, are inscribed upon the city's foundations. Now, twelve and twelve is twenty-four. Simple, isn't it? These twenty-four elders do something that is spine-tingling in chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. They fall down before the Lamb, Jesus, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. Then they sing, Thou art worthy to take the book and open the seals thereof, Christ. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hast made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. Here we witness the praise session of the ages. Hold the New Testament believers represented by 24 heads praising the Lamb of God for shedding his blood. Someone says Old Testament believers were not saved by the blood. Listen carefully. No one but no one gets to heaven without the shed blood of Jesus. That's why Acts 10, 43 declares to Jesus, give all the prophets, Old Testament prophets witness, that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Therefore, Old and New Testament believers, pictured by their representative heads, are singing about the blood in Revelation 5, 9, before the sealed judgments begin in chapter 6, which commences the tribulation hour. The Jews of old looked ahead to Calvary, shed blood as they offered the animal sacrifices, while the church looks back to the cross as the communion or memorial supper is conducted. Either way, it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul, Leviticus 17:11. Now, since these elders are already crowned, and since no one can be crowned until he is either resurrected if dead or translated if living, it is obvious that the resurrection has occurred by the time one hits Revelation 4.10. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 has transpired. We conclude then that the scene in Revelation chapters 4 and 5 is the direct result of the rapture, the great escape, before the judgments begin in chapter 6. Another area of truth concerning the great escape or pre-tribulation rapture that needs to be considered has to do with the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, before departing from earth to heaven, said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. John 16, verses 7 and 8. It is evident that the work of the Holy Spirit is that of conviction and restraint concerning sin. The Spirit of God does this through those whose bodies he indwells. 
1 Corinthians 6, 19 states, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you. Every child of God is indwelt by the Spirit. For if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of Christ, Romans 8, 9. Spirit indwelt believers have a purifying effect upon the world. They are the salt of the earth and the light of the world, Matthew 5, verses 13 to 16. Salt prevents spoilage and light dispels darkness. Think of the corruption and darkness that shall prevail when the salt of the earth and light of the world is removed at the rapture. No wonder Jesus said there shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, Matthew 24, 21. Does the Bible teach such an evacuation of believers? Here's the really a great escape before the tribulation begins. Definitely, and the second epistle to the Thessalonians proves the fact. In the first century, some post-tribulationists were already sowing seeds of dissent. They said that the church was already undergoing the trials of the tribulation. They even produced a falsified letter forging Paul's name that stated the church was in the hour of trial. Recent post trib writers have almost gone as far in falsifying facts. They even print names of men who adopted their viewpoint, and the men named wonder how they arrived at such a conclusion. Well, Paul, the misquoted one, settled the mess by stating in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 to 8, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who poseth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Paul, deeply perturbed by the forged letter, states, I understand that someone produced a letter, supposedly written by me, stating that the church was presently experiencing the pangs of the tribulation hour. Well, don't believe that lying prattle. Don't be bothered, bewildered, or shaken over such a distortion of facts. I could not and would not write such a letter simply because the tribulation cannot begin until two things occur. There must be a falling away first. Two, the man of sin must be revealed. Scholars of the past rendered the terminology falling away as a catching away. They talked about a time when the law of gravitation would be broken and men would fall away via the rapture to meet the Lord in the clouds. Other scholars believed that the Greek apostasius meant that an apostatized departure from the faith would occur. The important point to consider is that either must happen before the man of sin, the lawless one, the beast of the 70th week is revealed. This introduction of the Antichrist to the world inaugurates the tribulation hour. This means that the day of the Lord or tribulation period cannot begin until this monstrous maniac is identified to earth citizens. And he cannot be revealed until the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit is removed. For he that withholdeth and he who now letteth, old English for hinders, will hinder until he be taken out of the way. When he's taken out of the way, then shall that wicked one be revealed, 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 6 to 8. This does not mean that the Holy Spirit must be removed from the earth. This is impossible because he, as God, is omnipresent everywhere at all times, Psalm 139, verses 7 to 11. So it means that his hindering or restraining power over sin that keeps the Antichrist from mounting the throne is removed. This happens as the Holy Spirit's temples, believers' bodies, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, are taken from earth to heaven. Then the soul of the earth, the light of the world, is removed. This immediately produces corruption and darkness on an unprecedented scale, allowing the world dictator to come to power. This begins the tribulation hour. Then the beast of the ages rules during earth's bloodiest hour, proclaiming himself as God or Christ, 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. He rules until Christ returns to earth at the conclusion of the seven years. Then the Lord consumes him with the spirit of his mouth and destroys him with the brightness of his coming, 2 Thessalonians 2.8. The church of Jesus Christ is also repeatedly told to watch for his coming. 
In order to avoid any confusion, let's stick with church truth, the epistles of Paul. Paul says, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober, 1 Thessalonians 5, 6. Again, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, Titus 2, 13. In fact, the special crown is presented to those who watch. 2 Timothy 4, 8 states, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. So believers are to watch for the Lord, not for tribulation, not for the Antichrist, not for persecution, and not for martyrdom, but for Christ. This is the blessed all happy hope. Post-tribulationists do not have an imminent hope for which to watch. Why? Imminency, as applied to the Lord's return, does not mean all at once or rapidity in returning. Instead, it is a constant expectation of him on the basis that there is no revealed event that must precede his return. This is not so for post-tribulationists who know from Daniel that when the Antichrist mounts his throne, the 70th week or seven-year period begins. Revelation 11, 2 informs them that since half of the tribulation hour is 42 months, then 84 months from the rise of Antichrist marks the day that Christ returns and consumes the world dictator with the brightness of his coming. In fact, Revelation 12, 5 gives post-tribulationists all the evidence necessary to count off the days to the very end because 1,260 days is presented as one half of the horrendous period and 2,520 days as the completed schedule. So if Antichrist came to power, for instance, December 1st, 2,520 days later, he would be toppled at Christ's return. This is not imminency, but exact mathematical calculations. One would not have to watch for the imminent return of Christ, but count toward the expected day. Now this viewpoint contradicts the words of Jesus, who said in Matthew 24, 36, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Post-tribulationists could count off the seven seal judgments, the seven trumpet judgments, and the seven vile judgments. They could then bob up to greet the Lord and bob down for Armageddon. They even get in on that. In the meantime, they missed the crowning of the saints and the marriage supper of the Lamb because both took place in heaven while they were still on earth. They had no time intervals for such pleasures. They shot up and splashed down like a defective space vehicle, missing it all. Well, praise God, this will not happen for any part of Christ's church, even post-tribulationists. Like it or not, you will be there. Christ cannot have 1% of his church on earth while 99% is in glory. His body must be there in its entirety. His bride cannot be defective, missing fingers or toes at the marriage supper. Therefore... In concluding this study, let's ask the question one more time. Will the church go through the administration of God's wrath upon the earth? I believe not. Why? Well, millions upon millions of believers are already in heaven. All who've died in Christ for approximately 2,000 years are already with Christ. Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5, 8. Why should a handful of believers experience God's wrath while millions who lived and died the last 2,000 years enjoy the blessings of heaven during the tribulation hour? This would be inconsistent for God to have 99% of his church with him while 1% suffers untold agonies. Then again, since the Greek word ekklesia, translated church in English, means a call-out assembly, could not this definition extend to the very hour when the final called-out assembly meets the other 99% of the church already in glory? Why should a minority suffer God's vengeance while the others watch from heavenly places? We are all some members of Christ's body. We are flesh of his flesh and bone of his bones, Ephesians 5.30. Should 99% of his body in heaven rejoice while the remaining 1% upon earth suffers? Perish the thought! In fact, since Christ is the head of the body, he would actually be administering wrath to his own body if he left part of that body on earth for the tribulation period. Believers are also Christ's bride. Should 1% of the believers constituting the bride languish in anguish while 99% abide at his side? Let's be consistent in our thinking. Love demands that the remaining 1% join the 99% already in his presence. This same church, body, and bride, as already witnessed, goes through a time of examination called the judgment seat of Christ. The bride also experiences the marriage supper of the Lamb before returning with Christ to the earth. 
the post-tribulation adherents, teaching the yo-yo theory up and down, presto whipto, going to meet Christ and returning instantly, have no time interval for this judgment seat examination or marriage supper. If they are right, there's going to be a lot of indigestion because there won't be time to smell the supper, let alone eat it. God's word is plain as observed through an abundance of scripture. Jesus is coming soon and before the tribulation. Friends, are you ready? Christ shed his blood to save you. The acceptance of the Lord Jesus Christ as a personal savior is the only way to be ready for Christ's return. Bow your head now and receive Christ today. Then until the great escape, look up, watch, and expect his imminent return.